what's your take on this attack on Belgorod? It's a useless, meaningless gesture. I mean, certainly has meaning for those families who were lost loved ones in that attack. But it, it's something with zero military uh, significance. It, does, it accomplishes nothing tactically or strategically uh, for Ukraine. If anything, it weakens Ukraine tactically because they're using up very limited, expensive munitions, hitting a target that doesn't change a thing with respect to uh, Russia. I, guess, I suppose in, in the back of their minds, they're hoping that if they can kill a few civilians, that that will increase uh, anger at Vladimir Putin and cause the population to rise up, throw him over, so that then the West can take over Russia. I mean, it's, it's craziness on the part of the West. But I, I imagine that that's sort of their belief. But, you know, once again, it exposes the West to being uh, complicit in a war crime. They're using cluster munitions against civilians after the United States assured the world, oh, no, no, we, 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 the Ukrainians promised that they're, they're never going to use this against civilians. It's only going to be used against military targets. Well, there's not a military target in what they've hit so far. Quite a contrast with what has, Russia's been doing. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians have tried to go out and sell the story Oh, Russia's hitting schools and killing children, but uh, not really. Uh, you know, there have been a few that, that have uh, been wounded, but if if they actually were killing the children, you'd see the names and pictures plastered everywhere. It'd be on the front pages of the Washington Post and the New York Times. They would be showing that Israel is is murdering all these innocent civilians. When in fact, what Israel's doing is it's killing a bunch of factory workers who are producing everything from military clothing. Uh, there's one uh, one company called MTAC. They make some really good pants, I must say. I, I own some. But uh, they, they produce the military uh, uniforms for Ukrainians. The Russians hit that, blew that to smithereens, killed a bunch of their people. Other plants that were making drones, they got hit. Uh, tank repair shops, they got hit. So what what Ukraine did by trying to, let's say, raise the anger or ire of the Russian people has, in fact, turned around and reverberated it on them with far greater destruction than anything they visited upon Russia or could hope to visit on Russia. So Russia is dramatically stepping up its missile and rocket attack. And uh, exposing the Ukrainians has been capable of stopping it. Matt Miller from State Department says that Ukraine is not yet at the point where it can defend itself. Yeah. How can Ukraine get to this point? What's the reason behind this type of statements? Let, let me, I'll use an analogy. It's a story based upon what happened to a friend of mine. A friend of mine, he had another friend who's, whose son-in-law killed himself, committed suicide. And as they were going to the cemetery, the distraught father-in-law believed he was a very religious man, and he was he was praying that God would resurrect his son from the dead, praying for that. And my friend, uh, whose name was Dick, and his, the other, the distraught father-in-law is named Ed, he's looked at Ed and said, Ed, he ain't coming up. He ain't coming up. Ukraine ain't coming up. They can't. There's nothing they can do to revive it. What, are they going to magically you know, invent people? You know, fully grown men? You know, the, you understand, this is new parent, you understand this process. First you have a baby, then the child has to be nurtured and cared for, grows up over a period of 17, 18 years. Then you can turn them out for cannon fodder. Well, there's no way to circumvent that 17, 18 year period. That's nature. So, until somebody comes up with a magic potion or, you know, magic beans that you can suddenly plant it and a fully grown uh, man will pop out of the ground ready to conduct combat operations, Ukraine is going in, down uh, a, a long, dark hole. The, their population is about half of what it was two years ago, and partly, primarily because most have uh, ex exiled themselves. But they've also had well over a million casualties, 
between killed and action and wounded in action. And they're desperately sort of scraping the bottom of the barrel, seeing what they can get. Can they get any more people uh, out there in uniform? So the, they're not coming back. And these these people that think, oh, they just buy them some time. You know, let's give them some more money. Money can't buy you new people, period. And even if they, let's say that they managed to force every man and woman who above the age of 16 and below the age of 70 into the military in Ukraine, all right, where are you going to train them? Because Russia has already demonstrated any training facility in Ukraine is a ripe target. Russia can hit it. So where are you going to train them? And right now what they've done, they give these people cursory training, you know, try two, three weeks at most, and then stick a rifle in their hand, shove them to the front line where they're dead within one or two days. That's, you know, so they ain't coming up. Joseph Borrell and Sikorsky were talking about giving long-range missiles to Ukraine. Do they want Ukraine to hit Russian cities? And what would be the consequences of such attacks? If Europe and Germany, they do that, then they're setting themselves up as targets that Russia could strike back, you know, so it would expand the war. And the Germans really need to sit down and all of Europe, count the cost. Hell, they can't, they can't even produce... 155 millimeter shells. They've, you know, Britain admitted the other day, hey, we're tapped out. You know, they're uh, they're like the bank that's run out of money. They have no more loans to make. So uh, the, 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 these guys, they talk, and they're and what they what comes out of their mouth is so disconnected from reality. You, you really have to question their mental acuity. Are they are they mentally ill? Because, you know, you can understand somebody with schizophrenia indulging these kinds of fantasies. But these guys have not, to my knowledge, been diagnosed uh, medically as schizophrenics. But it certainly is crazy talk. British Colonel Breton Gordon, he was talking about the possibility of war between NATO and Russia. Is Ukraine that important <laughs> to have such a battle, such a war, direct war between NATO and Russia? Well, this war is turning out to be an existential threat to NATO, because existential in the sense that uh, Russia will have defeated not just Ukraine, but Ukraine was a proxy army of NATO. And NATO, all of all of its ISR assets, you know, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance assets that were devoted to providing uh, intelligence uh, to Ukraine, to, to locate Russian units, to be able to carry out airstrikes with missiles, with storm shadow missiles, with HIMARS. Uh, all of that's proved useless. Challenger, Leopard tanks, M1 Abram tanks, bust. Turned out to be nothing. The wonder, the Wunderwaffen, the wonder weapons of HIMARS. You know, a bust. How about Patriot? Patriot missile battery. That air defense system, it's really pay uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for, and what do you get? <laughs> Can't stop a Russian uh, hypersonic missile. So what, it, what, what this war has exposed NATO in a way that the, the, there would be a legitimate question when the conflict ends, why do we still have NATO? What's its purpose? Other than a jobs program for a bunch of white guys, you know, and all, and all of they get to pretend to command something. And yet, if NATO actually had to go to war with Russia, how? I, I'd like someone to draw it, explain to me how. Where are they going to? Where are they going to get these magical number of troops from? How are they going to get them into Ukraine without getting destroyed? What uh, air defense system are they going to suddenly produce that so far has been unable to stop anything that Russia has been doing? So, if NATO wants to go that route. Russia certainly has the, the kinds of missiles that can hit any spot in Europe, for starters. So it's just, and, and Russia has been very cautious about not wanting to expand the conflict, but they've also been very insistent on, they're not going to let NATO bully them or threaten them anymore. That's going to stop. 
these Ukrainians were trained in 34 countries. How do you see this system? Is that efficient? Are they going to reform this system? Because it seems that it doesn't work for NATO. <laughs> so you got at least four languages under your belt, but you understand how what you may say in one language does not necessarily always translate literally to another language. And so when you take a bunch of Ukrainians who most speak Russian, but you know, we got to teach them in Ukrainian and they may not all speak Ukrainian, but you, know, you got French doing the training, Germans doing the training, English doing the training, Italians doing the training, Dutch doing the training. Well, there's, you know, five different languages. So maybe they'll try to train in English, except you don't have the guarantee that it's in English. And so even if you've got a set curriculum that everybody's going to follow, you're still going to get differences. And, you know, part of the military training is learning how to follow orders and to hear how orders are issued in a particular language. And, uh, you know, one of the concerns I'd have with all the NATO different kinds of training is that uh, they may not get any consistency or standard uh, procedure for issuing such orders. So, you know, that that's number one. Uh, and number two, to really get trained and, and proficient in an, in an air, in a subject matter uh, is usually about a three three to four month period. Well, these troops start being sent away for three or four months. They're going for a month. So, I mean, maybe a month and a half, but that's you know, stretching it. So they're not even given the adequate training. Um, it's actually sort of like, you know, it's, we're talking Ukraine, but I did a piece about just the poor quality of the Israeli uh, military uh, because there's there's a YouTube video of one of their pistol instructors explaining why he trains Israeli soldiers who are carrying a sidearm, a semi-automatic pistol, which means the slide on it slides back and forth. And every time that moves forward, it will chamber a, a round of ammunition. Well, the Israelis instruct their soldiers to not carry around in the chamber ready to be fired. Why? Well, because they're afraid that they are so poorly trained that if they pull the gun out, they have their finger on the trigger and that they could shoot themselves before they would shoot who they're supposed to shoot. So he was admitting we train them to a lower level because we don't trust them to be a professional soldier. That's crazy. But that's what's going on with Ukraine as well, that they're not getting the kind of training. It's just you, you got to start with building individual skills, and then they learn how to work within squads and then work within platoons and then work within companies and then within companies. And so, you know, these different structures within uh, any military, any modern military organization, you need to learn how to both be part of a group, what your mission is there, how to interact with these other echelons that are above. And, you know, that that comes with experience. You, you could sit you down in a book and have you read it, and you'd just get overwhelmed with that's too much information. So uh, the, the, they're really putting the Ukrainians in a very difficult situation, asking them to perform and do things they can't. Uh, this uh, Colonel Jacques Baud of the Swiss uh, military and an intelligence analyst. Uh, he's just written a book, uh, and it's it's about uh, basically why the West does not understand the Russian military, and it's that failure to understand it, which is why Ukraine is losing, because the advice and the tactics and the plans that the West is providing are built around a concept that completely misses the boat on how Russia looks at war and fights. And one of the points he makes is that there's this tendency in the West to demean the Russians, to claim that the Russians are stupid, poorly motivated, that they're dragging prisoners out of prison, that they're having to snatch people off the streets to force them into the army, that the officers are a bunch of fat drunks who or incapable of doing anything. It's all a lie. And 
Vaud makes the point. He says, you know, the problem is if you start believing that yourself, then it's like a boxer who's getting ready to fight an opponent and has convinced himself that, you know, that the boxer is two feet or is one meter high and, and only may and barely weighs 40 kilos. Okay. So it's going to be an easy fight. Well, he walks in and all of a sudden he's facing a man that's two meters tall and, and weighs 110 kilograms. All of a sudden that's a whole different program. But if you prep to fight that guy, that's one meter, 40 kilograms, you're not ready to go with the two meter, 110 kilogram guy. He's going to destroy you, which is exactly what's happening to Ukraine right now. They, they, they keep talking about, oh, it's a stalemate. Oh, yeah, we the Ukraine's fought them to a stalemate. He's got, these guys have no idea of what a stalemate is. Um, a stalemate would be Ukraine's run out of artillery shells. It doesn't have any more. And Russia's run out of artillery shells. It doesn't have any more. But that's not the case. Ukraine has run out. Russia's got eight to nine times the amount and is producing it at a rate that Europe and the United States combined cannot match. That's just artillery shells. Ditto for tanks. Same thing. Hey, how about guys signing up to join the military? Ukraine is having to chase people down on the streets, grab them, club them, dump them into the back of a truck. Russia's got guys signing contracts at the rate of 41,000 plus per month. They were on track. They were on track. Apparently, the numbers uh, for 2023 close to 500,000 signed contracts. Nobody will put a gun to their head. Nobody sent them a draft notice. They signed up voluntarily. A half million men. And they're going through the training pipeline. They go through basic training and advanced individual training. And then they get the special training, whether they're going to work in artillery or drones or tanks, uh, mine clearance, uh, explosives, you know, the whole host of uh, subject matters and, and expertise. So Russia's got that advantage. Um, so, no, it's, it's, it's not a stalemate. And just if they persist in believing it's a stalemate, it's going to accelerate the loss. Oh, yeah, let's remember who has air defense and who doesn't. Uh, Russia has air defense. Its air defense system works pretty well. It stopped most of the missiles that have been uh, fired at Belgorod and in Crimea. Uh, Ukraine, nothing. The, the Whatever air defense system they have has been degraded, destroyed. Degraded the military jargon for saying we blew it up. When we look at the U.S. attitude in Iraq and Afghanistan, they stayed there for many years. Sure. And right now, it seems that their strategy <clears throat> in Ukraine would be the same. They, they would provide Ukraine with everything as long as Ukrainians are willing to die. Do you think that would provoke Russia to go to the western part of Ukraine? But no, I think I think what Russia's Russia is going to continue doing what it's doing. It's 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 engaged in a war of attrition. And by virtue of war of attrition, that means it's not going to go out and expend uh, its manpower and its vehicles and just mindless head on attacks on well defended entrenched positions. Uh, they've they have attacked certain some positions. They have had, have suffered some casualties, but the bulk of the casualties are being suffered by the Ukrainians. Number one. Uh, the Russians are closing in. It's, they're moving along a 600-mile front. That's a that's a lot of territory. And particularly when you're dealing with forces on, on either side that are uh, fewer than, uh, you know, Russia is estimated only have 300,000 guys in theater. Uh, it has a 1.3 million man army, but it apparently has only deployed about 300,000 to this effort, which is a lot of people except, you know, line them up Line 300,000 guys up along a 600-mile line, and it's not like you've got massive armies. Uh, so we're not seeing something on the scale of World War II. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, the, the Russians are going to continue to cause attrition on the Ukrainian side. And the Ukrainian ability to fight is going to it's going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. 
you know, I've I've used the analogy drawn from a movie by Michael with Michael Keaton, and it was called Multiplicity. And in that movie, Keaton finds out a way he can reproduce himself or a copy of himself. But the problem is with each succeeding copy, each copy is not perfect, number one. And each copy has a flaw. And by like he gets to the fifth copy of himself, well, he's borderline mentally deficient and mentally retarded. Very sweet person, but not very bright. That's sort of what's happening to Ukraine. I mean, it's, yeah, they, they can re-equip, they can get some new recruits in, but each succeeding generation of the military is getting worse and worse and worse, which means they're less capable of being able to respond to the Russian threats. So uh, there's going to come a point where they will break. Uh, I don't know what, you know, I, I anticipated it would be by summer, but, you know, I've been wrong in the past on my time predictions, so... Uh, It'll happen when it happens is the best way to say it. But the the trajectory, what we're looking at is the, the, the death. The, this is like watching somebody who's been in a car wreck. They're laying outside the automobile uh, and they've got a minor arterial, arterial blood uh, or cut. So what, blood is pumping out. It's not shooting out. It's not spraying, but it's pumping out at a rate that unless you get that blood stopped and get them at first aid, they're going to die. But even if you get the blood stopped, you get them first aid, they're so damaged, they're not going to get up and be able to fight or, or drive. So uh, that that's what's happening to Ukraine. I mean, it's a, it, it's horrific in terms of the human cost. Uh, but, you know, Russia's made it very clear. We're, we're not going to sit by and become a punching bag for the West which that's exactly what Ukraine was being used as, the boxer to punch Russia, to try to destroy Russia. The strategic defeat of Russia has been and remains the stated goal of the United States and Europe towards Russia. Ukraine war right now in Gaza, if something happens in Taiwan, how do you see the future of Europe? It seems to me that they're not having a grand strategy on their part. Your, Europe is irrelevant. All right. What does Europe bring to the table? They don't have an army of any in, any size or consequence. They're not an industrial power. They don't have any critical natural resources. And all they have is a entitled colonial past, where they've been the masters of the world, uh, you know, essentially raping other countries for the benefit of their own populations. And now it's sort of come full circle on them with the influx of migrants from a lot of their former colonies that were there to, uh, rapidly becoming the majority. You know, you see it in, uh, in in the city of London right now, where where the mayor's basically of, I think, of Pakistani defense, uh, descent. And so the Pakistanis, the Indians, the North Africans, you know, they're, they're becoming a an important political factor in all of Europe. What it, I mean, Europe, uh, it just has an inflated view of itself as being relevant. It's not. Candidly, the, the British and the French should be removed from the Security Council. They're, they're, they're not credible military powers anymore. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're just, they live off of a, historical legacy that's uh, sort of tarnished because of their role as being colonizers and uh, and enslavers, to put it bluntly. You talk about the influx of immigrants to Europe. It all started to intensify, to increase in 2010 when Obama was in office. They tried to overthrow Bashar al-Assad in Syria. It seems to me that they don't accept that they were wrong in all those policies. Look, this is like dealing with a degenerate junkie or an alcoholic. They've got to reach the person that you can see the self-destructive behavior. But the only thing that's going to change the self-destructive behavior on that person is that person or that country comes to the realization, hey, I've got a problem. I've got to stop this or I'm going to die. 
Uh, and, and that's exact the same thing that applies to a heroin addict or a, an alcoholic applies to countries and nations. You know, the United States, candidly, for the last 60 years, has been addicted to imperial military adventures. And it's destroying us. It has sapped the national budget, built up enormous uh, defense industries uh, that are, are incredibly expensive, not very good, but incredibly expensive, uh, diverted resources away from education, from infrastructure in the United States, and basically bankrupted us as a country. Uh, we, we just haven't come to grips with it yet. And, and, and to what end? That we didn't bring peace to Vietnam or to Iraq or to Syria or to Bosnia or to, you know, Libya. You know, it's just, you know, it, it's a it's a legacy. Uh, there was a book uh, written several years ago called Legacy of Ashes about the CIA. And that really is sort of uh, the legacy of the United States in that regard. And, and, and within that context of Europe, Europe is, you know, Europe's like an annoying little dog, uh, yapping, vicious, uh, but, you know, not at all an imposing threat, just an annoyance. And I'm yeah. sure that will win me, that will win me friends in, in Europe for saying that, but it's, you know, the facts are the facts. The French publication Le Parisien has called 2023 the year of Putin. September 2022, there was a counteroffensive on the part of Ukrainian that they were so excited about. They are going to defeat Russia. When it comes to 2023, what was the outcome? What's your evaluation of 2023 for Putin and his strategy? You got to start off scratching your head about the Ukrainian and Western strategy at the outset of 2023, where they said, oh, we're going to launch a counteroffensive. A major counteroffensive is coming. Coming soon to a theater near you. This summer's blockbuster, the counteroffensive. We're going to sweep across uh, Ukraine and drive the Russians into the sea. And we're going to do it because we got, you know, you know. So the last time I checked, if you're going to actually conduct a military offensive, you don't announce it in advance. Uh, the same way, if, I, if I'm going to attack you, I'm not going to warn you that I'm going to attack you. I'm going to come up and you know, punch you right in the, in the temple and try to put you down. Well, you know, Ukraine did the exact opposite. They talked about all, you know, they, it's going to start in May. No, no, it's going to, uh, it'll actually, it was going to start in April. No, no, then May, and then finally June, June 4th. This is when they finally got underway. And the Russians have prepared for it. You know, the, the I'm sure the Russians had intelligence, that they had assets, human assets in Ukrainian military intelligence services. The, the Russians knew exactly what the Ukrainians were going to do, where they were going to do it, when they were going to do it. And that's why they uh, undertook, uh, under General Surovikin, when he was still in charge at the time, constructed three defensive lines that were scattered, you know, about uh, 30, 50 kilometers in depth from front to rear. Well, the, the Ukrainians ran into those like a, uh, like a ship running into a bunch of rocks or reefs, and it tore a hole in it and sunk it, basically. Uh, throughout the entire the, the West, the Western planners really believed, sincerely believed, that uh, they were going to. They had given Ukraine a great plan. If Ukraine just executed, that they would be to the Black Sea within a week, two weeks tops. I mean, they really believed this, and yet these Western planners knew that. There was no air support of any kind, no credible air support for Ukraine with either fixed wing or rotary wing. You know, they, they didn't have the aircraft uh, to be able, that would be required to launch uh, an effective offensive against an entrenched foe. So right, right off the bat, they were sending Ukraine. This is like uh, this is like saying, okay, 
you know, uh, Nima, I'm going to put you into uh, an Olympic track event, okay? Uh, it's going to be the 400 meters, uh, but uh, we're going to cut off your right leg, okay? But uh, so you have to run it, though, in, in un under 60 seconds. You'd look at me and say, you're crazy. That's exactly what we did to Ukraine. You know, they were they were asked to carry out a ground offensive without any air support and with limited artillery support. Well, there's no wonder. And then on top of it, the, the Russians effectively mined the front so that it forced the Ukrainian troops to go into channels, basically like a narrow roadway, where then they could be picked off. At the, after, you know, June, July, August, September, October. So we're in five months and uh, the offensive was over because they had no more bodies to throw at it. And yet, yet even I said, no, I, I lied because the Ukrainians have continued to send troops across the river into Krinky. And they're good. The bodies there are stacking up like firewood. At a you know at a Norwegian shack getting ready for a cold winter, you know just piled on top of each other. So yeah, Putin Putin had a really good year. It wasn't just the militarily; it was uh, politically. The meetings with China were decisive in terms of forging greater relationships and cooperation, not just militarily but economically across the board. Uh, ditto with BRICS. Uh, so with with Brazil, with India, uh, and now BRICS expanding, bringing in Saudi Arabia, Iran, of all of all people, likely to expand to include maybe Mexico. It already includes, you know, Brazil was already one of the original founders. So you you had that movement. Uh, so it's just, you, you know, Russia uh, has faced these rumors consistently that they're running out of missiles, that they're uh, economies failing it turned out to ju to be just the opposite and maybe you know the the latest the latest charge is that north korea and iran are supplying missiles and advanced rockets to russia this this proves that russia is in trouble it's having to rely upon those guys that's not what's happening uh if you Put yourself in the shoes of uh, Kim Jong Un in in North Korea. So you've got an intercontinental ballistic missile, and you've always, or, or let's say something that's not quite as big as the ICBM, that it's a a theater size missile to be used uh, along the border of South Korea. Well, you've always fired it in at the test range, and the test range is such that the guys you know, know that it's coming so they know how to defeat it. How about let's get some real world experience, ship some of these to Russia, take our technicians over there so they can watch it. You can fire it. You can see if it's as accurate as we want it to be. You can see how the, what countermeasures the West may come up with and if those countermeasures are effective or not. It's a way to, the real world testing weapons that otherwise would not get a real world test. That's what's going on. Ditto for the Iranian drones. You know, Russia's producing its own, but but uh, both Iran and, and North Korea, I'd argue, are learning a lot from the Russians about how these weapon systems that they're using, uh, that Russia is using, operate and perform. It's not because Russia needs it. It's because I think it's a part of a broader Russian, uh, if you will, political military strategy. It's uh, um, a way that they can, you know, both help North Korea, help Iran and help themselves. And in the process, the West is learning some real hard lessons about uh, these additional capabilities from both North Korea and Iran. If something happens in Taiwan, Russia would send some military advisors to China to help them. No, I think I think what would be most more likely is that uh, Russia has vowed to China that it would help them with hypersonic missiles that could be used to target U.S. Uh, ships. You know, the uh, this war in Gaza 
and then the ensuing U.S. naval response trying to open the Red Sea and demonstrating that they can't, I think has been an eye-opener for China and for Iran, both as a, from a military strategy standpoint. They now realize that uh, you know, the, any attack on China is going to be either naval or aerial. Well, the aerial attacks can be defeated with uh, uh, sophisticated air defense systems, which Russia certainly has, and, and Russia has shared uh, some of the systems, not the most advanced ones, but some of those systems with both uh, China and Iran. So right there, you create an obstacle that could defeat any U.S. attack initially. And then on top of it, with these uh, cruise missiles, uh, these hypersonic missiles that could uh, easily destroy a U.S. naval uh, carrier strike group. Uh, so it, it really it changes the picture. The uh, China, I think, is going to let this play out politically. I don't think they're in any rush to try to force a confrontation with Taiwan. However, they are paying attention to the fact that you've got a lot of U.S. politicians and media personalities talking about China as an enemy as someone who must be defeated. And, you know, the United States is, it, we had sort of a, let's call it a 45 year love affair with the Chinese, uh, seeing it as a place to build economic opportunity, Tesla, Apple. People are now uh, having second thoughts about that. Uh, investment is down, US investment in China is down. But uh, China is also starting to branch out and see, try, you know, look for other all avenues other than having to rely upon both the United States and Europe as destinations for its products. What's the end game for the Netanyahu administration? It seems that they're trying to send these Gazans to some African countries. Do you think that would work for Israelis? What the end goal is to exterminate the Palestinians, er eradicate them. Get them out of Gaza, get them out of the West Bank, get them out of everything that is now considered Palestinian territory. And whether they die or they go into exile, Israel does not care. And that is not a view that's confined to just the ultra-right wing or just to Bibi Netanyahu. It is an, a, a far more disturbing attitude that is carried among many Israelis, a majority it would appear. So they're certainly going to try to kill off as many Palestinians as possible. The problem is the Palestinians are not easy to kill. I mean, they're tenacious. And uh, the Hamas in particular has proven to be a very difficult foe for Israel to beat. Uh, that's why this last week they, they announced that they were withdrawing 10 brigades that had been in combat operations since, you know, October ninth or 10th. Uh, why? Because they've suffered so many casualties, both physical and mental. There are reports that there are a significant number of uh, cases where depression, suicide uh, among Israeli troops. So uh, then the, I think government of Israel has grossly understated the number of wounded. I've, the numbers I've seen suggest uh, well over 2,000, maybe 3,000 minimum uh, have been wounded, which is significant. Uh, and those are those are ones listed as disabled that will not be able to return to military service. I'm not talking about the ones that took gunshot wound and may need a few weeks off to recover. Uh, so the, uh, the they're in an urban battle where they've destroyed a lot of the buildings and in destroying those buildings, they create natural areas that uh, fighters can hide in and not be easily observed. So it's, it's Israel, Israel is in a fight now that it's uh, can't win. I, I don't think easily anyway, without paying, paying a terrible cost. And on top of it, you got people in Netanyahu's government calling for them to start attacking Hezbollah up north in Lebanon. And you know, Hezbollah has been launching attacks, too, against Israeli uh, bases and kibbutzim along that border with Syria and Lebanon. And over 100,000 Israelis have been forced to flee. 
because it's too dangerous. So you know, this this thing has all the the markings of something that's going to expand. The the war will expand, not shrink. What's happening right now in the Red Sea? It seems to me that U.S. has to have some sort of solution for the situation in the Red Sea. How do you see the situation there? Are they trying to have some political settlement with Houthis, with other countries? Are they going to attack them militarily? How do you find this? They can't uh, figure out whether to uh, scratch their nose or wipe their butt. They're confused, the West. Uh, first of all, they've tried to put together this coalition that fell apart almost immediately. <laughs> I mean, even the French and, uh, and and Italians pulled out of it. Oh, no, we're not going to do that. Now they've sent this letter uh, threatening Houthis, you better stop this or else. Or else what? We're going to bomb you. Okay, go ahead, bomb us. The Houthis have been bombed for, they've been in a civil war getting bombed for eight years by U.S. drones. Um and yeah, they'll take some casualties. And then what are they going to do? They're going to keep firing more sh anti-ship missiles. Only this time, they'll be firing those anti-ship missiles at U.S. naval ships. Okay. They may sink one or two. Then the United States is going to be outright. Oh, my God, you can't do that to us. So we're going to escalate. How do you escalate in Yemen? You know, what? Bomb it back to the Stone Age? Hello? They're living in the Stone Age. In a lot of these places, the the country is not hospitable. It's not a place that Americans are going to get easy access to. And if if we get into another campaign of bombing and killing civilians, going to leave the United States more isolated. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, there there's no easy fix here. And then the Houthis claim is real simple: stop the killing of the Palestinians. Impose a ceasefire and let in humanitarian aid, we'll lift the blockade. If you don't do that, we're not going to lift the blockade. And th that's about as straightforward as I can put it. And you know, so far, the West has shown it has no ability whatsoever to stop that. You know, the, the ships that have tried to run the, ga the gauntlet, <laughs> you know, they, they catch a cruise missile here or there. So the shipping costs are just soaring. So this is going to have a real impact on global economy, uh, both as an inflation spike, as well as a, a shortage in supply chain. How the Biden administration is not thinking of a political settlement because it will solve everything for them. Why they're not forcing the Netanyahu administration? You know, Nima, you're going to find some people may accuse you of being a naive optimist because you use the term with the Biden administration of thinking. And when you use the word thinking, that presupposes they have a brain. I think there's some evidence to suggest they don't have a brain. And if you don't have a brain, you can't think because there's little evidence of thinking. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you, you know, you put your finger on it as far as um, what we're seeing is an administration that's captive, held hostage, by the Israeli lobby, uh, the American Israeli Political Action Committee (APAC) uh, has has its tentacles in uh, across the board, Republican and Democrat. Uh, controls the Republicans much easier than the Democrats. There's still you, you've got some uh, portions of the Democrat Party that are, you know, virulently virulently uh, pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel. But the vast majority within the Democrat Party are still leaning towards supporting Israel at any cost. So the United States is not even at this point thinking strategically. But I think world events are ultimately going to force us to have to think strategically once we realize that we're isolated and lost influence. So it's, a, you know, 2024, I think, is going to be really a watershed a year in terms of the United States losing more of its prestige and power as a, someone who can control world events. I think we're going to be more of someone who's reacting, you know, like you're hanging on uh, to a ride that's uh, run away.
we had a terror attack in Iran mm -hmm. and they were talking about that ISIS was behind mm -hmm. this attack. My question is why ISIS is doing this? Because with all this mess with that we are having with Gaza, with all these problems, what ISIS is looking for. Yeah, so this is an interesting correlation of forces where ISIS wants to get rid of Bashar al-Assad and the United States and Great Britain want to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. And Israel wants to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. So let me get this straight. You know, the United States, Great Britain, and Israel have been fighting against ISIS ostensibly because it's a radical Islamic extremist organization that wants to eliminate Israel. But they all agree, including ISIS, that they need to get rid of Bashar al-Assad because, well, he's friendly with Iran. So the, the, there would be that... So. This could have actually been an element of using ISIS, where the West used ISIS to carry out an attack. You know, kept the U.S. hands all you know clean of it, plausible deniability. That's one possibility. The other, the other to consider is the the Mech, the Mujahideen al Khalq, uh, who have been a, an avowed terrorist organization for at least sixty years, as I recall, going back to the nineteen sixties, uh, and. The U.S. used to have them on the terrorist list and then took them off under George W. Bush and the likes of John Bolton and others who have, uh, you know, like apparently have a financial relationship with elements of this group. So, you know, there, there are, some, you know, a couple of at least plausible suspects. Uh, but this, uh, you know, again, what does what does killing 100 people do other than uh, cause grief for the families that lose loved ones? Uh, and, and national anger directed at the people or organizations that carried it out and, uh, and a desire for revenge. I will say this about attacks on Iranians as opposed to attacks on Americans. Americans, uh, sort of like the Alzheimer's generation, they forget about it. You know, don't remember, don't recall. Not the Iranians. They're going to be remembered. They'll remember it for centuries. If you've done them wrong, they're going to remember it and retaliate, take revenge at some point. Um, it's, it's just, and that's that's not unique to Iran. That is, that's it's common, I think, among many of the tribal groups, ethnic groups there in the Middle East. But you know, they they hold grudges for a while. Uh, I, I heard about this firsthand from one of my CIA buddies. He, he ironically, was uh, he was running, controlling an, an Iranian intelligence asset that was working for the United States. And the guy comes to a meeting one day with my friend, and he, he was really upset. He was, I mean, visibly upset. And my friend asked him, he says, well, what's wrong? And this, uh, this Iranian guy goes, oh, he started describing this massacre of women and children and, uh, and these men and thousands were killed and how terrible it was. And my friend, go, the, my CIA buddy goes, gee, I, I haven't heard about that. So let me get, get the pen out and let me start writing this down. And where did this happen? Yeah. How many? Oh, my God, that's terrible. Now, when did this happen? And the guy stopped and goes, uh, I believe it was uh, 670 A.D. <laughs> yeah. Thousand plus years ago. He was remembering and talking about it like it was real. That Americans don't understand that mindset. And, you know, we think we can do these things and, oh, well, they'll forget about it. They'll get, they'll get over it. Some of them don't. And then there, there comes payback. So... Um, you know, I think this is you know, the, the assassination in general is one of the most stupid counterproductive tactics any military or intelligence organization can ever employ. Because all it does is it creates a martyr. It removes somebody who may have been an effective leader, bringing in leaders that can create more mayhem, more chaos, more violence. Uh, and doesn't necessarily get you any closer to your goal of, you know, we got to say, well, what's the goal here? 
and, and like in Israel in particular. The goal is, well, you want Israel to live in safety. Okay. Well, we're not going to get there by trying to kill everybody because you can't kill everybody. Or if you do, you end up killing yourself. So, you know, you've got to wake up and come to another realization. Mm -hmm.